Hey everyone, thanks for joining me today. We'll be speaking with Ron Sanderson, a powerful self-advocate. He works full-time in the medical field and is a professor of theology at Destiny School of Ministry. Stay tuned for his story. If you're enjoying our podcast, please rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts and share with a friend. That's how we make our voice stronger. Thanks for listening. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audio book download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash myautismtribe. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Welcome to My Autism Tribe, a community of advocates that are linked by autism but bound by strength. This is a time to find our sounding board and shoulders that help us carry life's load without the fear of criticism. We give and receive. We nurture and empower. I'm your host, Susan Scott. Today's guest, Ron Sanderson, is the author of A Parent's Guide to Autism, Practical Advice, Biblical Wisdom, published by Charisma House, and also Thought Choice Action. He has memorized over 10,000 scriptures, including 22 complete books of the New Testament and over 5,000 quotes. Wow. He frequently guest speaks at colleges, conferences, autism centers, and churches. Ron and his wife, Kristen, reside in Rochester Hills, Michigan, with their cute two-year-old daughter, Michaela Marie. I'm so excited for you guys to listen to a story. Let's give a warm welcome to Ron. Thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks so much for having me on your show. Always glad to do a podcast. Oh, it's awesome. And I know that you've done a lot of public speaking before, so this is just just another day where you get to share your amazing story. I, I'm really excited about it. I've read all about you, um, have seen videos on YouTube of all of your speaking engagements, and your story is so, so powerful, your story and your supporters' story. So I wanted to make sure our listeners were able to just hear how incredible you are as a person and wh- how incredible your journey has been. Thanks so much. I'm very happy to share my story and the journey with autism it continues to be a journey because I continually grow and learn more about my diagnosis and also how to be able to overcome the obstacles I face in life due to autism. Yeah, I know. And it's it, and it changes every day. And that's fine. I know that's a, a lot of what I've experienced with my son, not only my son, but also myself, just as human beings, you know, we're constantly evolving and growing. And that's the beautiful thing about life. So why don't you share with us kind of how it all started from the diagnosis when your parents really kind of started becoming concerned with certain developmental milestones? My development began normal. I said my first word, mommy, at nine months. And what I like to say is when I said my first word, mommy, it was the day I was being water baptized. And any child who thinks they're going to be drowned is going to cry out, mommy, mommy. (laughs) But then at 18 months, I went from being able to say mommy to only mom, mom. And 20% of all children with autism are going to go through a regression phase like I went from. I went from having perfect eye contact to zero eye contact. And my mom had two typical children not on the spectrum. Knew there was something drastically different between me and my brother Steve and Chuck. She immediately took me to a pediatrician. The pediatrician said, men are like fine wine. you got to give them time. <laughs> Women are like flowers. They blossom quickly and my mom knew that time was the essence she immediately got me an intense speech therapy i was in intense speech therapy all the way from age two to age 16 when i was seven years old my development was so delayed my brother chuck would introduce me to people saying you need to meet ron i think he's from norway because he speaks norwegian <laughs> he had me talk and only people who could understand me was my immediate family so they, he became an expert on Norwegian languages <laughs> and also when I was seven years old my mom entered me in kindergarten and I was so developmentally delayed in speech and also in social interaction ability the school wanted to label me emotionally impaired and my mom said it's not emotional it's neurological and if you can't tell me what's going on in my son's head I'll get him um, tested and come back to you and fall and tell you exactly what it is. She took me to Henry Ford Hospital, a neuropsychologist, did testing for three days, just me and him, intensive testing, and he came back to my mom and said, your son has autism. And in 1982, when I was diagnosed with autism, it was only one in 10,000 children were diagnosed in the U.S. Now it's one in every 59 
children and one in every 37 males. Mm -hmm. And when my mom went back to school experts and told them my son has autism, they said, if your son has autism, he'll never read beyond the seventh grade level, never, never attend college, never have meaningful relationships, and will never excel in sports. My mom was determined to prove the experts wrong. She quit her job as an art teacher and became a full-time RON teacher mm -hmm. and started working with me using art and using pre-ABA tech techniques of rewards systems to help me learn and come out of my shell. Wow. That's incredible. I think it the parents are so crucial in the early intervention stages, I think. And it's really just kind of pushing when you know something is, is wrong and really pushing to find answers. So I applaud your mom just for taking a stand and then also becoming just really incorporated into your education, too. So I read somewhere where you mentioned, you know, at seven years old, and this is kind of when you were starting kindergarten, there was a stuffed animal of a prairie dog. Can you share a little bit about this prairie dog and how that all came to be? Yeah, so my mom was inspired by Proverbs twenty two twenty nine. 29. You see man skilled in his labor, he served before kings, he would not serve before obscure men. And she noticed I had an amazing ability to name facts about animals, almost every animal in the safari card series. I could tell you every detail, where the animal was found, what it ate, um, its natural environment. And when I was seven years old, she went to Arts and Apples, which is a major art fair in Rochester Hills, Michigan, and they get about 20,000 people to go through Arts and Apples, and while she was in Arts and Apples, there was a stand where it was all stuffed animals that were handmade, and one of them was a prairie dog, and I instantly fell in love with the prairie dog, so she bought me it and gave me it for Christmas in 1982, it was the year I was diagnosed, and she used prairie pup to help me learn skills, she'd um, do letters from cheddar to squirrel and from the different animals that I collected, like prairie pup and She'd send me letters in the mail from Cheddar to Squirrel and also Prairie Pup, <laughs> teaching me social skills. And I'd, every week I'd learn a different social skill and I'd receive a letter in the mail from either Cheddar to Squirrel or Prairie Pup or Bouncing Bear or one of the other animals that were part of my collection. And she also used Prairie Pup to teach me using art. I draw per, or pictures of Prairie Pup and also tell stories about them. And then she'd have me draw artwork and then she'd have me dictate the stories to him write them down and she'd have me rewrite them i had dyslexia and by learning visually and not phonetically i was able to overcome dyslexia and also graduate from college undergrad with a three nine grade point average degrees in psychology and theology and also master divinity with a perfect 4.0 grade point average well taking three years of Koine Greek and becoming a master of the Greek language, biblical language. Wow. Oh, my God. That's a lot to take in. How amazing is that? I love your mom. I love you. I want to give you both a hug right now oh, over the phone. So this prairie pup... Um, or stuffed prairie dog, she knew that was a special interest. And so she really kind of used that to help educate you as well. And then was this, did this prairie pup, I know a lot of kids have that favorite stuffed animal that, you know, they take with them everywhere, they sleep with them. Was that the same for prairie pup? Yeah, prairie pup was, we describe him in my book, part of the Sanderson family. I still take him to every speak engagement I go to. He goes over 70 speaking events a year. He's been to over 12 countries and all around the world, even Madagascar. Wow. So he's pretty famous in his own right, huh? Yeah, he's pretty famous. He's met many celebrities. The last celebrity he met was Kurt Armstrong, who's Norman, who's Booger. When I introduced <laughs> him to Prairie Pup, I said, can you put your finger up your nose and take a picture with Prairie Pup? He said, I'll do even better than that. He saw Prairie Pup's nose up his nose and took a picture. <laughs> I'm sure that you have been able to meet a lot of just amazing people along the way. So I'm glad that to hear that Prairie Pup is, is still with you on your tours and everything. And so as far as you, you took Prairie Pup to school with you and, and everything, so he was with you wherever you went. Yeah, and he also helped me win a major art contest. And by winning the art contest, I met Hall of Famer 
Isaiah Thomas. Well, he was in his prime of his career. Isaiah Thomas used to do the commercials for DTE or um, Detroit Edison. And the commercials would have Isaiah Thomas and he'd say, look up. And the kid would say, I don't see anything. And he'd say, good, because there's no electrical wires. And my poster that won the poster contest for all of Detroit Edison for my age group was a bunch of animals, squirrels and prairie pup, building a fort near electrical wire. And it said, look up. And one of the squirrels is about to hit a transmitter with his hammer. And it says, look up. You don't want to become a furry fried friend. And it won first prize, and I got to meet Isaiah Thomas, who's now a Hall of Famer. And then um, that was the beginning of my art career. Wow. And so you are still very much an artist. Yeah, but my special interests have changed over the years. It went from art to, it went began with animals and went to art. From art, it went to track and cross country. I was one of the fastest runners in the state of Michigan my senior year of high school and got full ride to college. And then from running, it went to theology. And from theology, it went to becoming a professional writer. I have two nationally published books already out. And I have a third book where my agent just got a contract with a major publisher in Grand Rapids for me to publish my third book, Autism Express, Pairing Adventures of Faith, Hope, and Love. Wow. That's uh, absolutely amazing. And so kind of going back to something that you mentioned about being this star athlete, when did track or when did running come into the picture? Running came in almost, and this is why I say with autism, you got to get kids with autism out in the community doing things because that's when you find special interests. That's when you discover new hidden talents and areas where you're able to use those areas to develop skills. Autism is different than most disabilities in that you have these great mountain peaks of abilities, but these great valleys of disabilities. And those areas of disabilities, you may never be able to make them in the areas of strength, but you can make those mountains the areas of compensation for the valleys to overcome the valleys. And that's what makes autism very unique. With me, my ability for phonetic ability is um, very limited, but my visual spatial is off the charts. It's um, right in prodigy level when I've been tested. But my phonetic ability, if you went by that, you'd think I was um, on the lower end of the spectrum for functioning, even though I work full time and um, speak at 70 events a year. Yeah. And my mom was determined to take those areas of strength and make them stronger, and that's really what's been able to help me overcome and uh, accomplish so much is taking those mountain areas and making them higher like Everest and then um, in the areas of um, the valleys learning how to compensate for them and being able to overcome. Yeah, absolutely. So let's see, when you were in high school, I guess that was probably around 94, 95 yeah, 94, 95. And then the way I became interested in track, I was going to answer that question, was um, when I was in sixth grade, they had an Olympics event for all the students in middle school. And um, one of the events was a long jump. And when I competed in the long jump, I won the silver medal. And then that sparked my interest, getting that medal and feeling so good standing up there in front of all the students in the, the school. They had the whole school, sixth grade class, go to a high school and then compete on the track field. And winning that inspired me. And then a year later is when I began my track career. Wow. And you were not only a star on the field, but you were a great student as well correct i wasn't a great student until my junior year high school with autism our special interests are so much um more time consuming than everything else so when i was younger and i felt depressed and i wasn't able to really connect with the world or engage my grades were very low but after i got on the track team and started hanging out with young adults who were successful in academics and also track that's when i began to myself mimic 
their ability to study and mimic their ability for academics and and become focused on academics and that's when I became really studious is my beginning my junior year midway and um, senior year and that's when I started really excelling academics and college is when I um, graduated with high honors and all A's. Yeah well that's that's awesome. I think I also read somewhere where I I guess you rededicated your life uh, to following Christ maybe in high school and so yeah. um, I guess at nine months, so you were water baptized, um, and then that was when you said your first word, which was mom, and then uh, you were later baptized again went for the rededication. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so my junior year of high school, my relay team ran the 12th fastest time in the state of Michigan. On the way back from the to state finals, Nate Clay one of the star runners on our relay team who would later win the Big Ten for Minnesota and run under a four-minute mile in doing it, said next year we'll be the fastest relay team in the state of Michigan, but we won't have Ron on our relay team because it'll be past the age of it. And right then I heard God speak to my heart, I'll provide a way for you to run on the track team. And I said out loud to Nate and the coach, next year I will run on the track team, God will provide a way. And the coach laughed and said, in the last 20 years in the state of Michigan and all over the United States, no one has run past the age when we were competing in high school sports. Mm-hmm. And I knew I heard God. Things looked impossible. My mom called all the lawyers. They said it'd be over $40,000 for a lawsuit, which we couldn't afford. And during this time, I came back from a five-mile run. And when I came back there on the front page of Detroit Free Press was a young man named Craig Stanley who was born the same month and year as me, who was a track runner and cross-country runner as I was and had a learning disability. And the MHSA told his family they wouldn't let him compete just like they told my family. So my mom contacted his family. That week we had on the front page of the Detroit Free Press, me and Craig Stanley stated, now there's two young men in the in Michigan whose civil rights are being violated by the Michigan High School Athletic Association. Mm-hmm. And that Sunday... I was water baptized to reshow my commitment to Christ. And when I came out of the water, the pastor said, I saw heavens open in the verse, Joel 2.25, I repaid the years of the oaks, the great locusts, the young locusts, the other locusts, the oaks, more, and my great enemy son among you. So there's something in your life that ate away from you like locusts, and God's going to repay it and give you a message. And that very day, when um, I got home, the answering machine was blinking red, and when I pressed the button, it was a young man named Rick Landel. He had just finished his Ph.D. at Boston College. He had his law degree from the University of Michigan, and he said, I want to take your case pro bono. And um, he wow. took my case. We won, and we ended up running the second fast time in the state of Michigan. I got full ride for track and cross country. Wow. Gosh, I just got cold chills. What an amazing story. God is so good. Yeah. Wow. And so, okay, so you get this full ride to college. You're off. You're running, literally and figuratively. And let's see, you received the academic scholarship to Oral Roberts University. Yeah, is that so right? My, my freshman year of high school, or my freshman year of college, I, mean, I ran track and cross country for Rochester College, which is a local college. And then I had high honors. I had a... 3.9 there and then I got an academic scholarship from there to Oral Roberts University and then that's when I quit running track I got injured my freshman year after the um national right before nationals and then I started focusing in on academics so my interest changed over time sure yeah and so when did your lovely wife pop into the picture I met her in um 2010, and I met her on Plenty of Fish, which is a um, singles dating website. Oh, yeah. And I think one of the best places for young people with autism, to me, is um, online, because you can send messages. It's not as scary as meeting in person at first, and then get to know them through messages and going back and forth, and then after you get to know them um, from online, then meet them in person. That's kind of the... But, took place in my life. Yeah, that's a good point. 
I never really thought about it that way. But yeah, there's not that pressure of the face to face interaction, at least initially. So you guys met in 2010. And then I think you guys got married in 2012. Yeah. And um, the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, December 7th. So I always joke, having autism, I came in like a kamikaze. A world <laughs> wow. So tell me about your life today. You are a proud father, I know, to a little two-year-old girl. She's three. She um, She's turned three. three March 20th. Oh, okay. Okay. Awesome. And so tell me about your, your day-to-day life now. So my day-to-day life now is I work 40 hours a week in a hospital, and it's a um, psychiatric care hospital. I've been working there now going on 11 years, and it can be a busy um, job place because it's high turnover. And um, I work there as a psychiatric care special. What I do is lead groups, um, do rounds, help the patients. Basically, I'm a nurse's tech. Mm -hmm. And then I speak at about 70 events a year and then speak all around Michigan. This coming month, some places I'm going to be speaking is um, Easter Seals in Michigan to um, their autism group that they have there. I'm going to be speaking at two churches and then also doing other events, um, special needs um, fairs and things like that. So they add up quick the events, usually about five to seven each um, month I have set up. This past month was more so because I've been editing for my third book, which is going to be coming out hopefully sometime um, next year. We already got the publisher set up and all the arrangements with that. Now we're just waiting for them to give us a date and um, sign the contract that they're putting together right now. You're a busy man. I love it. It keeps me busy, yeah. Yeah, 70 speaking engagements a year is a lot. And... That has probably been just so beneficial for not only yourself, but all of the amazing people that you meet along the way just to hear. I think that's one of the one of the biggest things that I want to stress for my son. You know, he's just six years old, so he's not on a speaking tour yet, but I want to teach him to be a self advocate, you know, and want to see him advocating, you know, me advocating for him. And then when he gets older, as he gets older and matures, that he will be a powerful voice for himself. And I think that that's absolutely critical, you know, for for his future, because I see him doing great things. And that's really important to me. So I just commend you for all of the amazing things that you're doing and for being such a powerful role model to all of those people in the autism community. Just, it's absolutely wonderful. Thanks so much. Well, I'm going to put in the show notes for everyone your extensive bio uh, that you provided me along with your website that you have that they can get any kind of speaking information for you um, at spectruminclusion.com. And then also your email address I'm going to include in the show notes as well. So for anyone that wants to reach out to Ron, learn more about the amazing things that he has done and is going to do, please check this uh, website out. It's, It's absolutely amazing, and I can't wait to to read your books and share them with other people in my autism tribe. And I just want you to keep up the great work. You're such an inspiration. Oh, thanks so much. And thanks for having me on your show today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you're part of my autism tribe. So (laughs) just uh, let's keep in touch for sure. And we're all rooting for you every single day. Uh, We have your back and everything that you do and everything you're going to do. And thank you again so much. Thanks again for having me on your show. Like many children with autism, Ron lacked the ability to decode body language and interpret social clues, which resulted in ruthless bullying by his peers. If daily routines were altered, he experienced painful meltdowns. Things really started to change when he discovered his special interest in track. He, along with his amazing support system, never gave up. 
Now, thanks to the help of his parents and the grace of God, is living his dream, working as a professor of theology, serving in the medical field, and enjoying life as a husband and a father. Dreams come true, people. Stay the course, don't lower your expectations, and keep your eyes open and bright for the future. Sending much love to all of our listeners. Thanks for being a part of my autism tribe. See you next week.